Today I'm going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about RetroArch, using my Bayou Mini. What it is, how to use it, how to customize it, the best settings and options, and how to tweak the performance to make your games look and run perfect. You want that, don't you? Yeah, you do. <laughs> well, stick around. Oh, uh, hello there. I'm TechDweeb. Thanks for clicking on the video today. And subscribing. Uh, that's always nice. Let's get this out of the way right off the start. There's no correct way to pronounce it. It's RetroArch, but it's also RetroArc. There's good reasons for wanting to pronounce it either way, but the actual developers who created it and work on it call it RetroArch, so that's good enough for me. But you can say it however you want. I don't care. You do you, boo. So you want to know about RetroArch, do ya? Do ya? Well, this is the video you've been waiting for. It's all about RetroArch. I've had a few requests to make this video ever since I made my recent video on Onion OS on the Bayou Mini, where I asked you guys if you need a RetroArch tutorial video, and a few of you said yes. There's a link to that video below, and also my 2 minute tutorial where I show you how to install Onion OS in 2 minutes. So the Bayou Mini uses RetroArch for emulation, and there are lots of settings and things you can tweak using RetroArch, but it's a, a little bit confusing, I'll admit that. So I wanted to show you how I use RetroArch on handheld devices like this Bayou Mini, or the Ambler NIC 280D, or even the POW Kitty V90. You can run RetroArch in most of these little handhelds, and obviously RetroArch is ported to pretty much everything. You can get it anywhere. You can even download it for free from Steam for the PC or from Google Play to get it running on your phone if you want to. Actually, I'm going to be doing a separate video on using a phone as a retro emulation handheld, so get subscribed so you don't miss that. Oh, uh, sorry, I got distracted with Koba Triangle for the NES. You ever play that game? My uncle had this game when I was a little kid. Whenever I play this, I get taken back to his guest room with that striped wallpaper and shag carpet way, way back in the 1980s. He's dead now, though. Uh, let's get back to the video. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to use a customized RetroArch on the Bayou Mini in Onion OS, but RetroArch is pretty much the same on all devices, whether you, you're using it on a, a PC or your cell phone or a handheld. So some of these settings and tweaks only apply to the Bayou Mini, but the principles apply to any RetroArch installation. I'm going to be showing you several different things you could do, so I'm going to suggest you watch the whole video, but I included some chapters in case you need to jump to a specific section. You should at least watch the section about saving your settings because you'll need to know how to do that for sure. Real quick, a little bit about what RetroArch is. RetroArch isn't an emulator. It runs emulators on the back end, which are called cores. It's not an emulator itself. It's also not a front end. You know, the software that you use to look through your systems and games to decide what you want to play and then fire it up. You can use it as a front end to manually load up your cores and ROMs, but, but most use cases for RetroArch use it as a, a sort of middle band. It's a software that's launched by your front end. In this case, that's Onion OS and the BU Mini, and it runs in the background and manages all the stuff that needs to be managed. RetroArch runs the emulator and launches your games and gives you access to all the settings and configures all the complicated stuff for the emulator so you don't have to. And it's through RetroArch that you can customize all aspects of your emulation without needing to learn the complex parts like messing around with config files and command lines and all that malarkey. And you can also customize RetroArch itself. RetroArch is only confusing at a glance. Once you get used to how it works, you'll, you'll be a pro in no time. So without further delay, let's dive in and see be weeby if we can learn a little something here, shall we? Right. Now, we're going to start tinkering and it's pretty easy to do and it's hard to mess stuff up, but you can mess things up. And it'd be annoying for you if you had to reinstall the OS just because you changed some setting and now you can't figure out how to fix it. Also, on Onion OS, RetroArch is all pre-configured and most of it is configured perfectly. But there are a few games that'll require some extra tinkering. But more on that a bit later. But we want to be able to revert to the default Onion OS configs if we want to. So let's learn how to back up your current RetroArch config so you can easily undo any of the changes. And you can do this anytime you want to mess around. It's super easy. You just pop your SD card into your computer and on that you'll see a RetroArch folder. Uh, this contains all the RetroArch software and also all your configs and settings. Just copy that whole folder to a place on your computer. And there you go, you backed up RetroArch. Now you can go mess around to your heart's content. 
And if you want to undo your changes, just delete the RetroArch folder from your device and replace it with your backup. <laughs> you know, when I first got into this game, it lulled me into the false belief that I could skateboard. <laughs> the next time I got a chance, I jumped onto a skateboard and immediately tried to do a kickflip and I fell down and broke my wrist. <laughs> this game is dangerous, kids. Let me start by giving you the tour. Like I said, RetroArch typically runs in the background. So on the Mayu Mini, when I select a system and start up a game, it just launches right away. But this emulator is actually a core that's running in RetroArch. You can access the RetroArch menu by pressing the BU button and the select button. See, see all this stuff, all these options? This is RetroArch. Now, the thing about RetroArch is that there's sort of two main areas. There's the quick menu, which is a menu that's used to manage your current play session. So you could see here that you have save and load your state or reset the emulation or access some options for the current emulation core, which is where lots of the core specific tweaks are or resume your game. This is the quick menu, but there's also a main menu, which you can access by backing out with the B button. Here's the main menu where you can get back into the quick menu, but you can also go down here to the settings. And this is where you can adjust more stuff about RetroArch. In here, you can change the video options like the scaling and filters, and you can adjust audio settings, controls, latency, and the user interface, which is the UI for RetroArch. So let's wet our feet by changing the way RetroArch looks. In the main menu, we're going to go down to the user interface section. And in here, we're going to customize a few things. As you see under menu item visibility, you can toggle any item that you want to see on the main menu of RetroArch. We're going to leave these alone, but feel free to look through them and toggle stuff if you want. We're going to change an option in the quick menu. So we'll go into the quick menu section and here we can see that all the menu items that are shown in the quick menu. So let's turn off add to favorites because this is a feature that I don't use in RetroArch since the favorites function is handled by Onion OS itself. So I'm going to turn that off. And when I go back to the quick menu, you can see here that we no longer have the add to favorites option. Pretty basic stuff. Uh, let's do another customization for RetroArch, one that I definitely recommend. Let's change the color scheme for RetroArch. We're going to go back to the main menu and open up the settings and then open up a user interface. And in here, we'll go into appearance. There's a ton of options here. Again, feel free to look through these and you get a little description in the marquee at the bottom of the screen. We're going to customize the menu color. So under menu color theme, we could select one of these and see how it looks. My favorite is called Groovebox Light, but for this demo, I'm going to choose the custom theme that they have because it looks like a Game Boy. And you guys know how much I love my devices that look like old school Game Boys, right? This looks pretty awesome in my opinion. So we'll go back to the quick menu to resume the game. And when we open the RetroArch menu, we see that our custom colors are, are there to greet us. Nifty. But there's a problem. When we exit the Game Boy Advance emulator, like go back to Onion OS and then go back into the Game Boy Advance emulator by starting a Game Boy Advance game. Uh oh, none of our settings were saved. That's because we need to save our settings. So let's apply our custom palette again. There we go. Now to save this as the default for this system, Game Boy Advance. Uh, this is a little confusing, so listen up. There's a global RetroArch config, which is where you change the settings for RetroArch itself. And then there are specific configs that can apply to just one emulation core or one content directory, like all the Game Boy Advance ROMs in your Game Boy Advance directory or, or one game. So let's say you want to have a certain game use a certain setting, like a filter, but you wanted all the other games to use a different one. Well, this is how you do it. We're going to save our custom RetroArch palette to apply to all Game Boy Advance games. The way we do this is in the quick menu. There's this overrides menu. And in here, we could specifically save the settings we tweaked for this game, this content directory, or this core. So we're going to save it for this core. Now, when we exit the game and go back to the Onion OS menu, we can load up any Game Boy Advance game and boom, our custom menu colors are applied. Obviously, changing menu colors isn't important for game performance or tweaking system options. But this is just so I can show you how to save your settings. Mario 2's the best Mario game, and if you disagree, you can stub your toe. But this setting only applied to one core, the GPSP core, which is the default Game Boy Advance emulator. So if we fire up a, an SNES game, for instance, you'll see that the RetroArch menu doesn't have our custom colors. So what if we wanted to apply this setting to the entire device? Everything. 
We want this menu color scheme to be applied to all cores. Well, the way you normally do that is you make your changes and go back to the main menu and go to configuration file. And in here you would select save current configuration, which would apply these settings as the, the default of, across all of RetroArch on this device. But there's a problem. It doesn't work like that on the BU Mini for some reason. This option does nothing when you're in an emulator core that you loaded up from the Onion OS menu, but there's a workaround and I'll show you that now. What you need to do is load up RetroArch on its own without any ROMs or cores or anything. Just start the app. You can do this from the apps menu on the BU Mini. Select RetroArch. Now we have RetroArch started up and we can make our changes. In this case, we're going to change the user interface color scheme. Let's do a different color scheme just for demonstration. We'll use this groove box light. There we go. Now, when we go back to the main menu and go into config and save the current configuration and then exit RetroArch, these settings are applied to every core that doesn't have a custom override. So if we go over to SNES, you see that our custom color scheme is applied. And this will be on all the cores, Atari, Mega Drive, PS1, whatever. However, since we already applied a custom override for the Game Boy Advance core, our Game Boy Advance doesn't have this color scheme. It has the other one that we saved before. In this case, you can either set the same scheme and then resave it for each core that you customize, like we did with our Game Boy Advance settings, or you can delete the custom settings that we applied to the Game Boy Advance so that it can default to the base config that we saved. The way that you do that is pretty simple. You need to open up the file explorer from the apps menu, go into the RetroArch folder, and then into dot RetroArch, and then into config, and then scroll down to the default core for your system. In our case, for the Game Boy Advance, the default core is GPSP, and then you'll find the dot CFG file. You can either rename this and put the word backup in front of the file name if you think you might need to save the old settings for some reason, or you can just delete it by pressing the X button, exit the file manager by pressing the menu, and now when we open up the Game Boy Advance emulator by starting up a Game Boy Advance game, we can see that the RetroArch menu is the same as the one we saved globally. Oh my gosh, that, that was a big explanation of how to save menu colors, but it was important because the menu colors are just one thing that you could customize. There are loads of options, and some of those options you'll want to save for just the individual core. Most of the options are like that, to be honest, but some of the options you want to save for the entire application. I'd suggest that you do your RetroArch customization first. Like, select all your menu options and color schemes and all that stuff. Save that config. And then you can make whatever tweaks you want to the individual cores and you won't need to worry about conflicts. Man, I wonder. In, in games like this where you just walk around getting into fights with the local wildlife and just slaughtering everything, am I the bad guy here? Like, look at this happy little slut. He was just minding his own business and then I came along and freaking murdered him. Maybe a true hero would find ways to avoid fighting. That'd probably be a pretty boring game, I guess, without all the murder. Now that you know how to make changes and save your changes for each core, let's go and make some real changes that'll affect the look and feel of the actual emulation. And then we can save them as needed, since we know how now. So let's start with NES. In the NES emulator, which is Nestopia by default, we're going to make a few changes. First off, let's look through the options section of the quick menu and see what sort of options we have there. Each emulator core has different options here, by the way, and they're specific to the system that you're emulating. For example, here on the Nestopia options, we can rotate the buttons so that instead of the using B to run and A to jump, it's Y to run and B to jump, which I definitely prefer. It feels more like the old school IDS controller like this, or even like an Xbox controller. Using the bottom button to jump makes more sense to my fingers. So we'll toggle that setting and then we need to save it, right? So we'll go back to the quick menu and go down to overrides and we'll select save core overrides. So now that option of rotating the face buttons will be applied to all games run to this core, all my NES games. But if I only wanted that applied to this game, I would select save game overrides and it would only apply to this game. So that was the options for the core, that stuff in the options menu. But we can also change the settings. If we back out to the main RetroArch menu and go down to the settings, you'll see that we have several categories. Let's go into video and we'll change the video filter. I don't remember what the default filter was because I already changed it, but in this menu, there's a ton of filters to choose from. Some add scan lines, some smooth out the jagginess of the pixels, some are actually upscaling. 
Like if I select normal 4X, it upscales the image four times, so the pixels look super crisp. However, this has a performance impact, as you can see. So that's not gonna work. My favorite filter for the NES is the Scale 2X filter, which adds a little bit of sharp smoothing between the pixels and it makes it look a little bit more higher resolution than it is. See? <laughs> yeah, this looks great. I'm really happy with this and I want it applied to all my NES games. So I'm gonna save the core override and make, to make sure this is applied across the board with all my NES games. You know what's interesting? Not many people realize that this is how burgers are actually made. Yeah, burgers are made of giant burger patties and buns and pieces of lettuce laid out on huge girder structures. And the chef has to walk on them with his feet to kick them down to the next level while mutant sausages and tomatoes try to murder him. So, the next time that you eat a burger, give some thought to the brave chef who has to risk his life so that you can eat that. You're a true hero, little buddy. There is a ton of stuff that you could change in RetroArch. It'd be crazy for me to show it all in one video, but it's not really hard to go through all the menus and ch check out the sorts of things that you could do. In the video section, you could change the video filter, the scaling options, make tweaks to the vSync settings. Under audio, you could change the latency and the synchronization and the resample quality. Under input, you could change the turbo fire options. You can actually adjust the controls for the, the emulator or the whole system. You just go down to port one controls and you can make any button do anything you want. Want to have the X button to be jump and up be down? What are you, a bad man? Well, you can if you want to. Just make sure that after you make your changes to the settings, you save your core override. Or if you want to make changes to RetroArch itself and have it applied to all the cores, remember that I showed you how to do that earlier in the video in the Saving Global Settings section. So go back and watch that if you were paying attention. Now let's talk about performance. Sometimes you'll encounter a game or a system that gives you some poor performance. For instance, here on, on Mario 3, on the NES, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a tiny bit of audio stuttering. And the movement on the screen is a tiny bit choppy. It's barely noticeable, but I do notice it. And if you're sensitive to games not running at 100% perfect speed, you want to make some tweaks to get them running perfect. So as for performance tweaks, there's a few things I've found that can make a difference. The first thing to do is to remove any filters that you've applied. This will make the game look not quite as good as it did. It'll be a little bit blurry, but the filters are probably the most resource intensive option that you can apply and removing them is an easy way to get rid of that overhead. Another option that you could select is under the video menu, synchronization, you could completely disable vSync which will help a little bit with performance. This should not cause really noticeable screen tearing, but it might cause a little bit. At least you can try it out and see if it makes a difference. Another option that makes a difference is under the latency menu. In, in here, you could change the polling configuration and set it to late, which will put less priority on matching up the input with the exact frame and more priority on emulating the game at full speed. Obviously, there's a trade-off there, but I'd rather have a fraction of a millisecond delay in the input rather than audio and video stuttering. And finally, under the audio section, you can put the resampler on the lowest quality. And you can also disable audio synchronization, which will let the games run at full speed, even if the audio will skip a beat occasionally. These are all tweaks that you can do for troubleshooting. I wouldn't recommend changing any of this stuff at all if your games are working fine. And I personally would only save these options for the individual game that I've tried to get running well. So you'd use the save game override option for that. There are also options that will affect the performance under the options section of the quick menu. But again, th these are core specific. So some cores won't have any options to do with performance over here. But for instance, uh, in PlayStation, this is the area where you'll get your frame skip option or other rendering options like frame duping, a, a toggling dithering and speed hacks and stuff like that. And you can save these options either for the whole core or per game. Most games will run problem free from the default config. So I recommend only saving your performance tweaks on a game by game basis by using the save game override option. I used to love DuckTales when I was a kid, the game and the show. But you ever notice how the main mechanic in this game is Scrooge using his cane as a pogo stick, but he never once did that in any episode of the show. And you never once swim through piles of money in the game, but he did that in like every episode of the show. There's some missed opportunities right there. Let's talk about using different cores in RetroArch. 
The best part about Audit OS is that everything is pre-configured. It all just works and it works well, but there are sub instances where you'll need to mess around with stuff to get certain games working. For example, the default GBA core is GPSP, which is the amazing core that offers amazing performance. But there's one game I found that has problems, Duke Nukem Advance. As you can see, yeah, it's pretty bad. The 3D-ish style engine of this game doesn't play nice with the core. And none of the core options give me anything that'll fix that. So I want to run this game with a different core. There are two Game Boy Advance cores installed by default on Onion OS. So I'm going to launch this game with the alternate MGBA core. The way I do that is to open RetroArch on its own, not by opening a game, but by going to the apps menu and just selecting RetroArch to open it. Now I'm going to load content. I'm going to navigate to my ROM by going to the slash MNT slash SD card slash ROMs slash Game Boy Advance folder and selecting Duke Nukem Advance. And what I do, I'll be given the option to choose my core. The default GPSP core gave me problems, so I'm going to try the MGBA core. And there we go. Much better graphics. The engine seems to be playing nicely with this core. However, there are still some performance issues. So I'm going to back out to the main RetroArch menu and then I'm going to change the latency polling to late and then I'm going to remove the filter and turn off vSync and now the performance is much better. I don't think it's running at 100% perfect speed but this game doesn't run perfect on any device that I've tested. This is about as good as it gets. Since this worked out I want to try to make sure that the, it plays like this every time I play this amazing awesome game that I'm totally going to play over and over again. So I need to save the game override to make sure that these settings are applied every time this game is launched. And finally I, I had a subscriber ask if you could use cheats in RetroArch on the Bayou Mini. So ask and you shall receive. Yes you can. Normally in RetroArch you can use the online downloader to automatically download your cheat files. But since this device isn't online, you have to download the cheat file yourself. So let's give this a try. We're going to go to the cheat database. I'm going to link that in the description below. And you can see all the systems listed there. We're going to grab a cheat. Let's grab the cheat file for 1943 for the NES. To save this, you need to select raw, then right click, save as, Change the drop down from TXT files to all files and remove the .txt extension from the end. Your cheats should be the .cht extension and save this somewhere on your PC. Then you need to put the SD card from your device and your PC and navigate to the RetroArch slash dot RetroArch slash cheats folder and then open the folder that's the name of your emulation core. Since we're using the NES, our emulator core is Destopia. Just drop that cheat file in there. And then after you safely eject your micro SD card, you can shove it back in your Bayou Mini and open up the game that you want to be a filthy cheater in. Ordinarily, you'd expect to see the cheats option show up in your quick menu, but it's not here. So we need to add the option to the menu. I already showed you how to do that, right? We just go back to the main menu, go into settings, user interface, menu item visibility, quick menu, and then you can see the cheats toggle down there. Turn that on. Now, if you want this option to stay on the quick menu, you'll need to save your override, or you could save this system-wide using the method I showed you earlier in the video in the saving global settings section. Now, use the chat timestamps below if you need to jump around here. I'm going to save this as a game override because I only want to cheat in this game. So now that we have our cheats menu, we could go in there, load our cheat file and select the file that we put there, and then, and then we could turn on our cheats. I like to toggle the cheats and then manually apply them, but you can turn on this apply after toggle option if you want to have them automatically applied. I'm going to turn on invincibility and then apply it. Now when I get into the game, hey, hey, check it out. I'm being a sneaky cheater. Look how invincible I am. If you want the cheat to be permanently applied to the game, you'll need to save the game override after you enable the cheat. Soaring high in the sky, he may be small but only in size. Tech dweeb, flying planes in 1943. Oh yeah. And that's it. That's all the important RetroArch stuff that I figured you'd find useful, especially if you're using RetroArch on a handheld device like the BU Mini. It seems big and confusing, but it's really not. Once you figure out how to save your settings, either globally or on a per core or per game basis, the rest is just playing around, finding what works and saving your settings. But now I want to hear from you. Did you find this useful? Was there anything I didn't explain well enough? 
If you have any questions about retro arts or any suggestions for future videos on the BU Mini, just let me know in the comments below. And while you're down there, click the thumbs up button if you like the video, or the thumbs down button if you didn't like it for some reason. Subscribe if you haven't already. You, you made it this far in the video, so just freaking subscribe. What are you waiting for? As always, I'm Tech Dweeb. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Are you kidding me? I used to be so good at this game. I freaking beat this game when I was a kid. Now I can't even get to the friggin' boss. Oh my god, what's happened to me? In my old age, I've forgotten what's really important. Being good at Mega Man.